today we're going to be talking about the tongue. The functions of the tongue are for speech, mastication, swallowing or deglutition, and taste. Let's start with a few questions. This is a 24-year-old male with a history of asthma who is taking various inhalants. The lesions or structures at the base of the tongue are which of the following? Multiple fibromas, circumvallate papilla, foliate papilla, or fundiform papilla? If you answered circumvallate papilla, you are correct. These are the largest papillae on the tongue and are located in the most posterior dorsal surface, forming a V-shape with the point toward the posterior. At times they may be exaggerated and rise above the surface to mimic a tumor or tumors. If there were only one swelling in the midline in this region, one could consider the lingual tonsils. Next question. The condition noted on this patient's tongue, talking about the lateral surfaces here, is consistent with which of the following? Multiple fibromas, macroglossia, nervous habit, or both B, macroglossia, and a nervous habit? If you answered D for B and C, you'd be correct. The tongue is scalloped, which is a sign, could be a sign of macroglossia or large tongue. Frequently, it is also caused by a nervous habit of pressing the tongue against the teeth, causing the tongue occasionally to swell with edema and creating an impression with the lateral tongue of the embrasures of the space, the embrasure spaces of the teeth. There are many causes of macroglossia. Some are congenital and some are developmental. So this could be either macroglossia or nervous habit little of both. Okay, these lesions are noted on an examination and the patient now is asymptomatic but has noted a burning on eating spicy foods. What is your diagnosis? Geographic tongue, benign migratory glossitis, both or neither. More than likely this is geographic tongue which is a very common condition it's often associated with life stresses, stresses, common cold, any type of stress, and it's characterized by a loss of the filiform papilla, leaving reddened areas of atrophic, atrophic tongue that at times can look like a map. When you eat, this can be very, very tender if you're eating spicy foods. Oftentimes with geographic tongue, you may see fissured tongue with it. Speaking of which, here we are. This lingual condition may be associated with bad breath and is characterized as fissured or furrowed tongue, occurring coincidentally with geographic tongue, both or neither. I actually, unfortunately, I, I answered your the question as far as it's a fissured or furrowed tongue. The grooves tend to appear and get deeper and more prominent with age and half the time the patient has geographic tongue as well. If there is ulceration at the base it is a true fissure with necrotic debris. So debris can get embedded in these fissures and can cause some discomfort. This is usually considered just a normal condition of the tongue, but it is noteworthy. Other than explaining to your patient they should brush their tongue, there's really no other treatment for this. Okay, you will find that we talk about the tongue in, in both head and neck anatomy and in histology and embryology. So I'm not really going to talk about the different types of papilla you find, or papillae. That you'll be talking about or you should have talked about already. But there is some crossover so I will expect that you will know the foliate papilla around the sides of the tongue and so forth. So if we were to talk about the apex of the tongue, we're talking about the tip of the tongue. The body 
makes up the bulk of the tongue. And this is usually visible by a simple inspection. And then there's the base or the root of the tongue, which is the posterior third of the tongue. This is located in the pharynx, and really the only way to see this is with indirect vision using your mouth mirror. Remember that it's a very common site for oral cancer, so you really want to make sure that you visually inspect it as well as palpate the area. Okay, again, here's the base of the tongue. Inspect with mirror and gauze. This is fixed to the hyoid bone. If you remember correctly, I mentioned the hyoid bone is also known as the skeleton for the tongue. It's also fixed to the soft palate, the pharynx, and the epiglottis. And again, here are all the different papillae. The lingual tonsils, which are part of the immune system, cover the surface of the root right back here. So it's posterior to the circumvallate papilla. They're knob-like masses of lymphoid tissue. This provides defense, a defense mechanism for, for infection. It can become ridden and enlarged during infection. Here's just a beautiful picture of the tongue. But as you notice, here's the circumvallate papilla, which is Posterior to the circumvallate papilla is your lingual tonsil. Here's your foliate papilla. Here is just some anteriorly placed lingual tonsils. Again, it's part of your immune system. And during infection, you may find that these tonsils become enlarged. Here you will see a, a plug in the tonsillar crypt. This is in the palatine tonsils. Remember that if you see a plug, this could be either bacterial or viral. This may cause you to postpone treatment. So when you're doing your, your cursory exam when, before you start your intraoral exam, always look in the oropharynx area, again, to see if you need to modify or postpone treatment. This is the epiglottis, which is a cartilage structure that overhangs the larynx like a lid and prevents food from entering the larynx and the trachea while swallowing. Again, this is not part of the tongue, but it's attached to it. Here's a picture of very large tonsils, and you can actually see the epiglottis behind the base of the tongue. I believe you've already seen a picture of hairy tongue, which is just an overgrowth of the epithelium of filiform papilla. And this can be caused from medications because food can get entrapped there. It can cause discoloration as well as odor. Geographic tongue, we've already talked about. This is due to a loss of the epithelial covering of the filiform papilla. Remember, the filiform papilla is the velvet-like papilla around over the tongue. This leaves red, smooth, shiny areas on the body of the tongue. It may change size, shape, and location. So when you're looking at this interorally and you see it, you're not going to note every area where there is the loss of the papilla only because it changes every time, but you will note that there's geographic tongue and you'd want to talk to your patient about spicy foods, etc. Keep in mind that the tongue can really tell you a lot about overall health, how somebody's feeling. If you look to your right, you see the strawberry tongue. It truly looks like a strawberry. And this is a common symptom of scarlet fever to see this. Now on the other side, we've already talked about the, the fissured tongue, which is a totally benign condition and is considered by most to be a variant of normal tongue architecture. Again, it's noteworthy. Food can become embedded in this and cause discomfort. And also, this is common in people with Down syndrome. 
least occurs the tongue. The circumvallate papilla are the most commonly associated with your taste buds. Embedded on the sides of the circumvallate papilla is von Ebner's glands, which are responsible for taste. So these are special afferent nerves are responsible for the taste sensation. And this the taste occurs when a chemical substance contacts a receptor cell in the taste bud. There are different types of taste sensation, as you know, sweet, salty, bitter, sour. Taste buds are not only found on the tongue, but they're also found on the soft palate and the epiglottis. If we look at the ventral surface of the tongue, the mucous membrane is a thin vascular area which is this mucous membrane covers the inferior surface the tissue again is thin and vascular and is attached to the lingual gingiva there's also the lingual frenum I'm afraid to use my cursor here that's why <laughs> sorry about that so I'm just going to say lingual frenum we're going to talk about it in a minute lingual veins Fimbriated folds, which mark the location of the, the deep lingual artery, which gives the blood supply to the tongue, sublingual caruncle, and the sublingual folds. So if we look th at the fimbriated folds, I'm going to try this, we will find right here that these are irregular fringe folds of tissue that extend obliquely on either side of the midline. They shape a shape of a V <laughs> and it marks the location of the deep lingual artery. The sublingual caruncle is a small fleshy prominence located just anterior to the frenum, saliva from the submandibula and the sublingual glands enter the mouth here. Okay, I'm going to use this. It's right here. <laughs> now we have the sublingual folds. These are found under the tongue, extending from either side of the lingual frenum. These mark the site of the sublingual salivary gland. Here's a good picture of the frenum, although this, the frenum is a fold of mucous tissue. It attaches the tongue to the floor of the mouth, but in the pictures that are here, it is showing that the frenum may be located too close to the tip or maybe too short, which will limit tongue movement and may cause a speech impediment. It's also referred to as an ankyloglossia. Remember, glossia would mean tongue. The ventral surface of the tongue, this is where you find the lingual veins we've talked about. They're it's often visible through translucent epithelium, and they may become varicose. Note here, you can see the varicosities of the tongue. It's really just noteworthy. It, it's perfectly normal when someone ages to get that. Now look at those mandibular anterior teeth. Wouldn't you just love to get a power-driven scalar on that? Or this is a good example of if you didn't have a power driver, driven scalar, which hopefully you would have, you could actually take your sickle and your anterior sickle and just get a lot of that calculus off before you use your more area specific curettes. But again, power driven. Okay, the blood supply of the tongue is from the lingual artery, which is a direct branch of the external carotid artery. Now, we saw in previous pictures the deep lingual vein. This is an area can, that can be easily punctured during tongue piercing. So it's something you really want to educate your patient about because someone piercing a tongue may not know the anatomy of the tongue as well as he or she should. Let's talk about the nerve supply. The tongue contains nerve fibers for general sensation, which would be hot, cold, pain. These are general afferent. I'm going to exaggerate afferent and efferent. 
to show the difference. Taste sensations, again, I had mentioned already, these are specialized afferent nerves. And then motor innervation, this is for the muscle movement. This is somatic efferent. So if we talk about efferent nerves, I think of efferent as equals exit. And I've gone ahead. Sorry about that. We'll do efferent first. Efferent brings messages away from the brain. Again, efferent equals exit. These are all your motor nerves. So these may go to skeletal, smooth muscle, cardiac, and some glands. Remember that this is what, if you want a certain muscle to move, it's the efferent moves that take that, mu that message away from your brain to the area. Now if we go to afferent, these bring messages to the brain. All sensory nerves are afferent. Obviously if something tastes good, you taste it and then it brings, that nerve brings that sensation to the brain. If you touch something hot, etc. So again, all sensory nerves are afferent. Just move ahead here. So when we talk about the nerve supply of the tongue, we should know that the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is a little bit different from the posterior one-third. The anterior two-thirds, the general sensation is the lingual nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve number five. We're going to be talking about that in a couple of weeks. Taste sensation is from a branch of the facial nerve, which facial nerve is cranial nerve seven. It's the cauda tympani nerve. And as I've mentioned in the past, the trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve are probably the most important nerves in dentistry. So when we talk about the nerve supply for the posterior one-third, both the general and the taste sensation are supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the ninth cranial nerve. All muscles of the tongue except for the palatoglossus, the glossus, excuse me, the palatoglossus muscle are innervated by the hypoglossal nerve, which is the 12th cranial nerve. I believe you may have seen palatoglossus, palatoglossus muscle before because it's also considered a muscle of the soft palate. But because the fibers are alongside the tongue, they insert into the sides of the tongue at the root, so it's included in the tongue muscles also. Here's just where the cauda tympani nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve are located. Okay, think about a person complains of being able to experience touch, pain, cold, pressure on the anterior two-thirds of his tongue, the affected nerve is what? Again, touch, pain, hot, cold. That would be the lingual nerve. If there was a problem with the taste sensation, that would be the cauda tympani. So again, touch, pain, heat, lingual nerve. Okay, of course, wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about muscles. There are intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the tongue. We're really going to focus on the extrinsic, but the first let's talk a little bit about the intrinsic muscles. The intrinsic muscles start and end within the tongue, and these determine the shape of the tongue. These muscles are what allow you to roll your tongue. There are four groups of intrinsic muscles superior longitudinal, which turns the tip and sides upward, the transverse, which originate on the median septum and run laterally, the inferior longitudinal, together with the superior lo longitudinal, shorten the tongue. Again, this 
muscle here, the inferior longitudinal, turns the tip and sides downward. The vertical, its action is to flatten and broaden the tongue. On an aside, my daughter must have an amazing vertical muscle. She can make her tongue very flat. Well, the intrinsic muscles are innervated by the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12. And here are just the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. I don't want you to get bogged down in the origin and insertion. We're more concerned with the just controls the shape of the tongue. We're going to talk more about the extrinsic muscles, which originate elsewhere and insert into the body of the tongue. These control the position of the tongue. This anchors the tongue to the mandible, styloid process, and the hyoid bone. They consist of the styloglossus, hyoglossus, genioglossus, and palatoglossus. And if you think of the names, styloglossus, probably think of the styloid process to the tongue. Hyo, hyoid. Genio, geniotubicles, and palatoglossus. This is the, the muscle that I talked about already that's in the soft palate, considered a muscle of the soft palate and the tongue. So the styloglossus, its origin is the styloid process. Its insertion is the fibers run downward and forward and enter tongue at the posterior third and continue to the tip in a horizontal fashion. So what do you think the action would be? Remember that the insertion usually goes through the origin. If you think it's to retract the tongue upward and backward, you'd be correct. Now we talked about the hyoglossus. Again, the origin is the hyoid bone. Insertion is fibers that run upward and obliquely and insert into the lateral borders of the tongue. Again, if you think about the insertion goes towards the origin, what do you think the action would be? Again, if you thought it was depress the tongue and draw the sides downward, you'd be correct. Genioglossus. Remember the genial tubercles on the anterior, the inside of the mandible, right in the center by the symphysis. These are little um, project projections of bone. So the genioglossus, the origin is the genial tubercles, the insertion fibers run up and back and insert along entire length of the tongue from apex to root. So again, based on origin insertion, think about what the action would be. It would be to protrude the tongue and depress the tip into the floor of the mouth. Gene Simmons of KISS, I think you may know him from a reality show, but he really has a, a great genioglossus muscle. So I, I pose a question to you. Why is the genioglossus muscle of importance in maintaining an airway in the unconscious patient? Remember when we're doing our ABCs for CPR, we would need to maintain the airway. Why is the genioglossus muscle, muscle of importance? Well, if you think of where it originates, the genial tubercles, it spreads out like a fan backwards into the bulk of the tongue. In the unconscious patient, the tongue falls back, blocking the airway, and the simplest way to stop this is to push the angle of the jaw forward. In doing so, the genioglossal muscles are pulled anteriorly, and the bulk of the tongue is removed from the oropharynx. So think about how we lift the mandible up. This is to get that muscle out of the airway. Okay, one last muscle we need to talk about, the palatal glossus. 
Again, it's usually classified as a muscle of the palate, but because its fibers insert into the sides of the tongue, at the root, it's also included as an extrinsic tongue muscle. Again, if you're thinking about origin and insertion, figure the action would be to elevate the root of the tongue. It gets a little tricky here because the innervation is different. This palatal glossus muscle is innervated by the vagus nerve. Okay. Here's a patient that you've instructed to stick your tongue straight out and after you're perfectly clear that understands the instructions, sticks the tongue out and it deviates to one side. What might this indicate? It could be that there's a unilateral lesion of the hypoglossal nerve, which causes the tongue to deviate towards the affected side when it's protruded. Remember that all muscles of the tongue, with the exception of the palatal glossus muscle, are innervated by the hypoglossal nerve. This is also of utmost importance. As I had mentioned before, the tongue is a great indicator of overall health. But there are two common sites for oral cancer, and they're the two most common sites for oral cancer. Those are the lateral border of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. So again, you really want to make sure that you can visualize these areas and you'll have to use indirect vision as well as direct vision.